shining in the midst of the darkness shining jesus light of the world shine upon us set us free by the truth you now bring us shine on me shine on me shine jesus shine Good morning, and welcome once again to Let the Bible Speak. Good morning. I'm Jim Larson. I'm Dave Grant. It's good to be with you, and uh, thank you for tuning in to two one-hour specials that we're going to be presenting here this week and next week. You know, the last 50 years ago, the Apollo mission landed on the moon. What an incredible moment that was for our country, for the entire world. Neil Armstrong saying, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And what a great moment it was. And we all remember that. Anybody who was alive back then, or even if you weren't, uh, they'd been showing it again over the last year with it being the 50-year anniversary. But we also might remember then, not all that long after that mountaintop experience, the words, Houston, we have a problem, were heard with Apollo 13 as we struggle just to bring those three men back home to planet Earth. Houston, there is a problem. Dave, is there a problem? Well, Jim and I have decided to address the change in our society. Um, it's a, a problem in that we're not being as civil toward one another as we used to be. And it's seen in the news a lot, sure. you know, and Normally, the news is the bad things that are happening. But very rarely do we see the, the good that's coming out of it, except on TV6. They do a great job of showing the good that's going on in the Upper Peninsula. But it, all of us watch the 24-hour news cycle, and they're just always at each other. And there's always somebody who's angry about something. So what we want to do is we want to discuss from a biblical perspective and produce these shows one hour in length. That way we can actually uh, cover more material. Normally our 30 minute show just doesn't, isn't enough to really fully develop a topic like this. And we had to have two one hour shows to actually go through these eight characteristics that we believe will help us do a better job in having a positive impact on our community. Um, one of the things that, that Jim has brought to my attention, and, and I've noticed it a lot ever since we've, we've been working together on these shows uh, at home and at the church building and, and developing them. And he brought this up at the beginning of our, our prep that maybe the UP is a little different. And I, I, the last few days, I've noticed it's different. I mean, I was in a ditch. I had four different people want to help me. So... Tell us about why the UP might be a little different and how that impacts our discussion today. Right, we're going to be looking at incivility and not being considerate and some of the negatives that we see in our society. But uh, here in the UP, <laughs> it's a little bit different for sure. Uh, and that's a good thing because we are different people up here. Uh, UPers are special. We know that. <laughs> And the way we think and the way we act and being in smaller communities per se, I mean, even Marquette and Escanaba aren't that big of communities as being the bigger ones in the Upper Peninsula. But some of our even smaller communities where everybody knows each other and people are kind to each other and they do check in on their neighbors and they do open doors and they do help people. We do help people across the street and things like this we see often going on in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And so but we're not totally isolated or immune from this wave, if you will, or this new way of treating people 
that we see growing and growing across the country, across the world, and yes, it's even infiltrated here to the wonderful Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Maybe not to the same degree as other areas. And may, well, our hope is that the, this program will help continue that progress of not going down that road. Well, not only that, but we have a worldwide audience. I mean, I'm getting you know, responses on the YouTube videos that we post. True. Um, and we're getting people from all over who are watching and, and that's, that's affecting us too. Um, I don't think we're totally isolated though from the standpoint that um, someone called me an idiot just the other day. You know, I was walking into Walmart and I don't know who the person was. They said, you're an idiot. You must have went in the wrong door. You know how those doors look like they're on the wrong side? The exit and the enter, he must have went in the, in the exit door. And, and I've been told by my wife, never call anyone an idiot or stupid. So I was offended by that. I didn't you know, beat the guy up or anything because then that wouldn't have helped build this kind of new influence that we want to have on people. Uh, tell them about the book. One, the book that we're going to be using and uh, referring back and forth to off and on is written by a, a man named Aubrey Johnson. And he's one of our uh, brothers in Christ here in the Churches of Christ. And uh, the book is titled, Consider One Another. And, and that's going to be the theme of the show. Now, we're going to be mostly looking at biblical aspects of this, of course. But being able to consider one another is the key to the, everything that we're going to be talking about. Because if we don't consider other individuals, we're doing this on our own. And, well, it hasn't been working so great that way. No, so we need a little tweaking, maybe. A little fine-tuning, if you will. Or yeah. maybe some places an overall. And, and Aubrey's subtopic is God's answer to incivility. Yeah. So we want to just make sure you understand what we're talking about, what we're targeting. Incivil means that you're not being like a good citizen behavior unbecoming of a citizen. Well, in, in the context of the United States and the news cycle, um, we're, we're talking about being civil to each other in our country, even when we don't agree with one another. And so what I really want to do is deal with the idea. It comes from a Latin word. Civil comes from a Latin word, and that word means uh, behavior not of a citizen. So if you're a Christian or a God-believing person, you're going to want to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, of righteousness, of goodness. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're actually taking the book just one step further, even though he does a great job on it. And we're going to tell you how you can order your own copy of that book if you'd like uh, later on in the program. But what we want to do is look at the kingdom of heaven um, God's kingdom and say, well, what is behavior that is in accordance with the kingdom of heaven, of being a Christian? So that's where our main focus is going to be, but we're going to first establish this incivility and this um, way of acting and being unbecoming of a citizen. For, for instance, a citizen of the United States of America, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that liberty and the pursuit of happiness endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights and among those rights are liberty and the pursuit of happiness conduct if we're a citizen of the united states we're going to take this to heart and we're going to try and live this way right conduct unbecoming an officer in the military say or in the police force an officer should never act that way they should be above those actions follow a certain code of conduct, right? And they do, because they've taken an oath. And from the Christian perspective, which is where we're going to hang out most of the program, behavior unbecoming of a citizen of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, would be opposite of how God would have us to act toward each other, how to treat each other, how to interact with one another. Unfortunately, there's a lot of behavior going on these days that is unbecoming of a citizen. Whether that be a citizen of our country or a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And we're hopeful that 
as we go through these this, these two weeks that we will be able to establish a good path to go down and that we are more just a, a little bit maybe more aware of being considered. I mean, personally, just doing these programs, studying with Dave, going through it together, and now doing, I've been more aware of how I'm acting out in the public square mm -hmm. uh, because I'm thinking, well, if I'm not doing it, how can I even talk about it? And so I'm thinking about <laughs> where can I be more considerate? Where, and we'll get into the specifics of those things as we get through the program. Let me read a passage um, to get us started on this idea. It's the Apostle Paul is giving guidance and direction to the early believers, the early citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Well, we can learn from that. And from that, uh, Paul's going to give us some direction even today. So I'm going to read in Philippians 3, verse 17 and following. Philippians 3. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and their glory is their shame, with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Any comments? There's a pattern of behavior that we're supposed to follow, and it does not look <laughs> like the way we're following it currently in society. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing out there, and I'm sure you're seeing too and experiencing firsthand as you walk around, go travel, go to do business, go to school, all the different aspects of life, it's out there. We're not following the right pattern, God's pattern. Now I know that when my mother would, back in her younger days, did a lot of sewing and we had some of our clothes she made. Well, she would get these patterns from the store and she would lay out the pattern, she would lay out the material, and do the chalk line on there and, and cut the pattern to exactly the way it was, follow the measurements, and do everything that it said to do in the pattern in order to make a shirt or pants or a blouse that was like the picture on the front of the pattern. If we don't follow God's pattern for our life, how can we expect to produce a society like the one he has pictured for us in his word, particularly within his church? Something needs to happen. We so, got to get to the pattern. Yep. And a lot of times the pattern in our modern world is rejected to color outside the lines, to chalk outside the lines and do be creative. I'm not against creativity, but if you want to have God's will produced in your life, you're going to want to listen to what he has to say. And the problem of incivility, not treating each other like we should, doesn't just affect our politics, which it does. I mean, that's where the news cycle just seems to, uh, every newscast is about one of the politicians arguing with each other, or calling each other names. But it also affects our churches and our families. And so the more this influence is rising in our nation, it's going to get into our families. It's going to cause us to treat each other that way as well. Um, it's kind of like when... Uh, I have a friend who became a Christian about 20 years ago. And he's a part of our church. And he had a pretty foul mouth. I um, mean, every other word seemed like. But he wanted to be pleasing to Jesus. And so he had to change his behavior and follow the pattern that we find in the Bible. And he was all gung-ho for that. Well, he made some slips along the way. But now there's no way you would ever dream this man ever had a problem with his mouth. So it, it is possible to influence for good, but we have to be willing to look at God's word and go with that. Um, when we disagree with someone, if we follow the pattern that's on TV, we can call them names, we can ostracize them, can't hit them. You know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, legal problems there, but you can call people names like crazy 
and you can make them actually on the social networks, you can actually hurt people. So what I would like to do is cause us to look at, well, let's go back to the early days of the scripture. Jim's got uh, some ideas of uh, even from the book of Isaiah. There's a scripture where at the very beginning of the Old Testament book, Isaiah the prophet, that reads like this, Come now, let us reason together. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Hmm. Reasoning with one another is the only way to make progress. And reasoning requires listening. It requires hearing. It requires reflecting. Responding in a proper way. It seems as though reasoning together has been thrown out the window and driven over by the bus. That if I have an opinion, that's all there is. You can't have yours and we can't reason together. We can't go back and forth anymore. I'm right, you're wrong, and we're not going to talk about it. Well, that's not reasoning. And it's not caring. It's holding a, a position and only not being open to anything else. But reasoning has this give and take to it and listening and being a major part of it. Take listening, for instance, conversations. If all the time when I'm listening to you speak, all I'm doing is thinking about what I'm going to say, am I really listening? I don't think so. Am I really hearing what you're going to say? I doubt it. Can we possibly reason together? No, because I'm not hearing. Respect for one another's position without necessarily agreeing with it can be okay. You might remember the longtime baseball radio announcer for the Detroit Tigers also did television. His name's Ernie Harwell, very highly thought of in the sports world uh, when he was alive and even still today these, these years after he's been gone. He was sometimes doing the chapels for the, the players that on Sundays when they couldn't get to church and they had to play ball on Sunday, which is pretty much every Sunday. Mm. And he said, uh, one time he said, if given the choice of either being right or being kind, most often it is better to choose being kind. Now, did he mean that being right is wrong <laughs> or it doesn't matter? No, of course not. What he was saying was, is you can be right and you can be bam, 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 but maybe sometimes maybe we ought to just be kind and listen. And still we can hold our position. We can hold on to the truth. We don't have to give up the truth to be kind, do we? I don't think so. So Jesus offered a better way to live, a better way to interact. And we hope the examples that we share with you will help all of us have a positive effect on our society. Now, I know that I don't have a worldwide effect. Uh, I don't even have a statewide effect. But if I influence the people around me, and each one then influences the people around them, it grows. And so I really hope that just our sharing this time with you today will give you an opportunity to reflect and say, yeah, I'll look at what Jesus offered because his way has changed the world and for the better. Um, Brother Johnson titled his book, Consider One Another using a passage in Hebrews. Now Hebrews is toward the back of your Bible, um, one of the larger books, it's easy to find, but he quoted in his book and used it in the title from the, King, the New King James Version, and it looks like this in that version, and we'll have it on the screen here so you can take a look at it. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, in Hebrews 10.24. So when we look at let us consider one another, that means we're actually going to go outside of ourselves and think about how someone else is responding. So what do you think about that, Jim? To stir up love and good works, it says there in Hebrews, to stir up love and good works. Both Dave and I believe that as a society, 
we still have within us, and particularly within the church, we have love, and we have good works, and we see that across the Upper Peninsula too, love and good works being established. But maybe we just need to get in there and stir things up a little bit mm -hmm. to stimulate our thinking with the truths of how to live properly in society the way that it's t spoken to us through God's Word in the Bible. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 19 it says, Do not put out the Spirit's fire. You think about a fire, you know, stirring things up. Anybody who's burned wood, and many of us have in the Upper Peninsula, the, eventually the fire goes down and the coals kind of cool off, but you just get in there with the poker and you stir them all up again, and then you throw in a couple new pieces of wood and put a little air with that, and away it goes. We believe that this program, these two programs, we might be able to stimulate, we might be able to stir things up a little bit. That we just are more conscious of how we treat each other, how we treat one another in the public square, in the home, in the church, in the school, in the workplace, mm -hmm. everywhere. And if we can do that, then we can make a difference, Dave. Yep. And you can make a difference. That's the most important thing. It may not seem like an overwhelming, but again, it spreads. And so we want so much for you to join with us, because both of us are on board now. We're, we're actually thinking about it on a daily basis. And so doing these lessons always helps a teacher more than anyone else. Certainly. When the Hebrew writer uses the word consider, he's telling us to take thought for others. So this thoughtfulness implies that we look for ways to apply these characteristics that we're going to look at in our everyday lives. And believe me, we have ample opportunity. All of us have ample opportunity to practice. Did you go somewhere to purchase groceries this past week? Well, there's opportunities at the grocery store, whether it's Walmart or Meyer or one of the local grocers. The cashier, the stock person, and other shoppers are all people we need to consider. I just saw, had that just happen this last week. I was, in, I was in one of the stores, and I had talked to one of the, the, to the, to the guys that was stocking the shelves at a different time, months before, about something totally different that he was involved with. And uh, it, it was, if, I think it was tickets to a wrestling match or something. Anyways, he remembered me. And when I came by, he says, hey, how you doing? And I said, good. And we got to talking again. And uh, I was in kind of a hurry. But because of this, <laughs> these shows and doing what we're doing here and talking about this, I said, stop. You're not in that big of a hurry. Stop and talk. Thoughtfulness. And I did, and it was nice. Yep, and, and, uh, and that's going to spread because I, he's going to see what you're doing. Yeah, and he's going to take a little more time with someone too. I was looking for pasties, and there was only one in the frozen freezer there. And so I asked another another gentleman. I said, uh, "Do you have any more pasties?" He says, "I don't know. Let me look." So he goes in the back room, and he's gone for a few minutes. Pretty soon he comes out with this cart with all kinds of pasties, and <laughs> I could choose the ones that I wanted and, and make my purchase. And he showed courtesy to me, and so I, I wanted to show courtesy to him too and spend some time. And he's, he's not just the guy to give me the pasties. He's a human being. Yeah, and he's deserves a, your thoughtfulness. And deserves my thoughtfulness. He's, he's probably got a family at home. Just, we're all the same, folks. We all have these things going on. So consideration for one another needs to be at the top of our list. Just being considerate. Because outside of our immediate world, there may be hostility. And it may bump into us once in a while. Um, if you're driving home from the grocery store, do you have any opportunity to practice consideration for others? All the time. Allowing, a thoughtful driving is very important. But there are so many times people haven't been thoughtful to me and I just want to get angry and, and yell at them. Well, that's... They did something to me and I want to do something back. That's not the way to be. Let's be thoughtful. Look for ways to be courteous and kind and loving. Um, let's look at some of these positive characteristics. The first one, and Jim's going to introduce this, is to be considerate. Because something is definitely wrong. You can sense it throughout the public setting. 
disrespect, irresponsibility, lack of self-control, these things are increasing. It's, it's obvious. And this decline in civility toward one another has resulted in the decay of meaningful relationships and a dramatic drop in the enjoyment of our public life together. Jesus taught us a different way. And I would encourage all of you, all of us, to take time and read what's called the Sermon on the Mount. Mm. The Gospel of Matthew. Remember, we got the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you go to the Gospel of Matthew, in chapters 5, 6, and 7, Jesus is doing most of the talking. And this is his sermon. This is the perfect sermon because it's from him. And he covers many of these things. And in fact, if you've got a Bible that's a red letter edition where Jesus' words are, this is all red. <laughs> and this is where you want to read the red because it's right from Jesus. And he, and he discusses these things with us. Um, you have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. I'm in Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. But I say to you, do not resist one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Oh boy. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anybody forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse one who from wants to borrow from you. And then you go into loving your enemies where you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But Jesus says, hmm, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This is where he's coming from. Mm -hmm. Is that considerate? That's considerate. But let's look at Matthew 7. Okay. Move over to Matthew 7. And I'm going to have you read something too. But I want to read uh, verses 24 and 25 of Matthew 7. Where it says, everyone then, Jesus is speaking, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And when the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house, it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. So the, and he'll later tell us the rock is his teachings so we have to put them into practice to build our spiritual house. Well, that's our, the way we treat one another, the way we consider one another. So he's taught them a lot in Matthew 5 and 6, an early part of 7. And now he's saying, put them into practice. When I tell you to love your enemies, put it into practice. And you will have a spiritual house that will never be shaken by the storms of this life. Now, a wise person then is one who considers considers the consequence of consequences of his choices. I can live my life the way I want to. I have that freedom. Mm -hmm. But I want to consider others in my choices. So when I'm looking at uh, being considerate, I develop a process of thinking that actually is kind of like a, a protocol of thinking. I want to think about others first and then think about myself next. So it's a, it's a protocol and it's going to lead me then to think about, well, who taught me to think about others first? It was Jesus. So he becomes part of the equation in my protocol as well. I think about him, I think about others, and then I consider the impact on myself. And I'm blessed as a result of it. So what is God's will? How would Jesus respond? Those are the kind of questions I ask myself when I have to make a decision. What is God's will? How would Jesus respond? And how would my actions affect that other person? So how often do we go through a protocol like it? Now you might think, well, you mean I gotta remember all this? It, it comes natural after we begin to practice these things. As Jesus said in Matthew 7, put them into practice and initially, yeah, it, I got to say, okay, so what would Jesus do in this situation? And make my decision based on the will of God, how it will affect others, and my spiritual house will be strong. Well, one way to your protocol, Dave, to remember if you're just trying to get started is a very simple acrostic, joy. Jesus, others, yourself. Well, that's mighty simple, I know. But how many times do we do it? <laughs> Most of the time we got it flipped over, don't we? ourselves, others, Jesus, or ourselves, Jesus, others. Yeah. 
Uh, but we generally don't go, Jesus, others, yourself. And if we will simply follow that, that's going to get us in the right mindset to start thinking about that other person first, above ourselves. What he's saying here in Matthew 7 is the opposite is true. It's a foolish person doesn't consider others. Mm -hmm. And so it's not based on the teachings of Jesus. And when the storms come, and they will come. This life is full of storms. And I'm not talking about the thunderstorm or the lightning storm or the flooding. I'm talking about the real storms that affect you, like your health, mm -hmm. your relationship, your church. There's a lot of things that can go wrong because human beings are involved. And so are you prepared to handle these things with strength, with faith? Because... Jesus said, if you put his teachings into practice, your house is on a rock. And I want that kind of thing. Now, here's the key. Because the storms are coming. They will come. Storms of life are bound to happen. So what, what matters is, doesn't matter whether who you are, what your social status is, what your relationship to the Lord is, any of these things, the, the storms will still come. Mm -hmm. The difference is, what is my house built on? And if it's built on the Word of God, it's built on Jesus as, and particularly here in the teachings that he shares with us in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, then we know that we're on the right track. You know, our house is strong, and mm -hmm. we will be able to withstand the storms. Matthew seven twelve, you want? Yeah, uh, because I think the Sermon on the Mount is like a, a springboard into what Jesus really wants us to know. Mm -hmm. And the key here is... Jesus taught that the secret to healthy relationships is how we treat others. All right. Well, let's get this in before we take a little break here in the, in the mid part of the show here. Uh, if you've got a Bible and you've got it open to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12, you're going to probably have a little subtitle there that says the golden rule. Now, lots of people have heard of the golden rule. Here's what it says. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Whatever you wish others would do to you, you do to them. This is how we should treat one another, how we want to be treated. Mm -hmm. And so I got to think about it in every circumstance. And just, you just can't just throw this out there, the gold rule, and then leave it out there. It's, a, it's something to implement every time I have an interaction with another individual. Uh, am I considering them, how they need to be treated, or am I only considering myself? Uh, they have to flip that over and get that cog, so to speak, switched so that I'm always thinking that way. And it'll take some time, won't it? Well, let, let's think about it this way. Have you ever uh, felt that someone should have said thank you? Um, well, that's how you feel, right? right? So are you treating others that way? Do you say thank you? <laughs> are, or are there times that you, you're not thinking about other people and you don't say thank you, or you don't say well, excuse me, or I'm sorry? Well, when it happens to you, it, it kind of bothers you. So that is what Jesus is talking about. Think like that toward other people, the way you want to be treated. You want to take a break? Yeah, you do. We, uh, we offer, yeah, take some time. If uh, This is an hour-long show, and usually we're a half an hour, so if you need to get up right now, now's a great time. We're going to, in the next few minutes here, you won't miss too much. We're just going to offer uh, what the, the things that we give away on the program every week. We start off with the Bible Correspondence course. Um, it's a seven-week, seven, uh, seven-booklet course. starts with the way to life. God has spoken. This is good news. Knowing Jesus. Born of water and spirit. The family of God. Live a life of love. Well, that's what we're talking about, isn't it? These will help you with doing more in-depth study in your home as you uh, continue on that we're so thankful you're watching the program today and, we, and many of you watch every Sunday and we thank you but there's there's more to it the, a half an hour or even an hour isn't enough uh, a week so this would help any individual increase their faith understanding and uh, belief in the Lord and you can take it at your own pace yeah um, when you let us know that you want to take the course I'll send booklet one out to you and then when you complete it and write any questions you have down Mail it back to us, and then we send you the next lesson and answer your questions. So it's, uh, it's at your own pace. There's, there's no rules. <laughs> so we hope you want to take it. But 
you need a Bible to study with if you're going to take this kind of a course. And we offer, free of charge, a hardcover English Standard Version Bible, which is the same one we use on the program. And it's a, a more literal translation, which takes us right to the heart of what the original language was saying rather than what we're talking like today. And uh, I love the English Standard Version, and we can give you that copy because they're made available to us to pass that savings on to you. Um, Jim did a couple shows just the last two weeks on his eternal plan. Um, why don't you tell them about that book and how we can offer them a copy of that? Just as a reminder from the last couple of weeks when I, I did those uh, programs, we were talking about my good friend Jerry Tallman, who's a wonderful evangelist and brother in Christ. And uh, he wrote the book, His Eternal Plan, which is a, s a very simple guide to help individuals learn about God's plan for your life, uh, for your eternal life, but also how to live here, which is going to be a crossover from things that we're talking about here today. So we'd like to offer you all those things, the Bible Correspondence Course, the free Bible, copy of Jerry's book, His Eternal Plan. All you need to do is contact us at the Church of Christ, and we will be happy to send you any of these materials. So we look forward to uh, hearing from you and providing those things for you. And Dave, you know the address, and uh, if you'd like to share that. So I work with the Escanaba Church. It's P.O. Box 751, Escanaba 49829. But I encourage you to go to our webpage, which is letthebiblespeak.net. And you can not only review any of these programs by watching them, by clicking a link, you can actually order, program, um, order the Bible course or the Bible. Um, I also have the email address there. So you can send in prayer requests or if you have a question, I would love to respond. Jim and I have been talking about the possibility of doing a, a special sometime in the future where we would take questions from the audience and it wouldn't be live, but you could send in your questions or write them in or on the internet and then we would deal with the questions that the, the viewers have. So uh, we pick the topics that we talk about here on the program, but maybe you'd like to pick them. <laughs> we, we'll give you that opportunity sometime in the future uh, and probably take a one hour slot to do it. But uh, I hope that you'll take advantage of that. Also, we mentioned the book, Consider One Another, God's Answer to Incivility. Um, Aubrey Johnson has written this book and printed it, but right now I'm having trouble getting a second copy because there was some kind of glitch in the computer program. But I have the address and where you can order it. Um, we're not giving this book away, but uh, I can give you the address uh, if you email me or call me, and then you can contact them and, and order a book for yourself. It's a great, great book, both of us. In fact, I'm giving this one to Jim um, until I can get time to order one for myself. And I've read it, and I'm going to read it again. And uh, it's one of those books where you can read it multiple times and, and, and gain, glean from, from it. Because, uh, again, this is something that just has to be reminded in, in, to us over and over again on how to act. <laughs> because uh, we forget. We get wrapped up in our own lives. We get busy. We get excited. We get stressed. Uh, we get worried. We, all kinds of things happen. And so we need to continue to move forward with our lives and, and to do the things that God would have us to do. And the next thing we're going to talk about is being kind. What does it mean to be kind, Dave? Well, this passage uh, in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, is kind of a, looks at the negative side of life, but it actually gives us something to avoid. Uh, it's frank. It's very right in your face about the sinful nature. So if you want to turn to Galatians 5, we're going to read verses 19 through 21 to kick off this concept of being kind. 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of rage, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, 
oh my goodness, this is really wearing me down. But that, that, all of those things I recognize in our society, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Now he's talking to Christians, says, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, when I look at that passage, I realize this is what I'm trying to avoid. This is what I was called out of, to be a child of light, not a child of darkness. Well, some of the things that we've identified as being part of our, the wave that's affecting our nation and the world, they're, they're listed in there. Enmity, um, being angry with each other. There's so much a part of the flesh, the sinful nature, that we need to learn how to step out of that. Now, Jim and I, in our practice, we actually uh, looked at this and I said, how come I didn't go to um, verse 22? And so here, I want to read just a little bit more. But the fruit of the Spirit, with a capital S, that's Jesus, that's God. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh or the sinful nature that we talked about in the previous verses. They've crucified it. They've said, no, I'm not going to be like that anymore. With its passions and its desires. So the works of the flesh and the sinful nature, that's a nasty list of Oh, of, it, it of wears me down to read it. It does. But it's unfortunately what we see and I'm sure you see, but right after that comes the fruit of the Spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, and the patience, and the kindness, right smack dab in the middle. The fruit of the Spirit is kindness, the act of being kind to another. That's very well actually went in, in the displayed in this parable of the Good Samaritan. And most of you are probably familiar with the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's found in Luke 10, but rather than, it's quite a, a story. It's, Jesus develops the story, and we're going to summarize it because the Good Samaritan is basically someone who does something kind to another. And in fact, the Good Samaritan can fit it into every one of these characteristics we're talking about. Yes, he can. Um, so. What's the first thing you remember about the Good Samaritan story? Well, the, the thing is that it, there's a, it comes within the, the testing of Jesus, if you will, and people want to try and catch him. And the, the lawyer stood up to, to him and to start testing him and uh, says, what do I have to do to inher inherit eternal life? And Jesus sends a question back his way. And finally, it gets down to, well, show me who my neighbor is or how to do this. And that Jesus tells a story or a parable, if you will, on how to act and, and who is doing the right thing. And, and the, the thing that grabs me the most is, well, I don't know, much of it grabs me, but as it, it, it comes to play, you've got the man who's going down, let's just talk about it a little bit. It's, there's the man who's going down the road from Jerusalem down to Jericho, or Jericho down to Jerusalem, on, on down the hill, and he gets attacked, and he gets robbed, and he gets beaten up, and he gets left for dead. He's in bad shape. He's been violated. And so here comes help, right? The cavalry's coming. It's the priest, the religious guy. He's going to stop and help him. He doesn't. No. The Levite, also a very religious man from the tribe of Levi. Great history. Well, certainly he's going to stop and help him. Over to the other side again, just like the priest. But then the hero of the story isn't who you'd expect. He's the, he's the guy that doesn't have the great religious background that the Jewish mm -hmm. man has, the, the priest or the Levite. He's not who we would expect to stop. We'd expect him, the no good Samaritan, to just keep walking. And he stops. He's the one. But I guess what really grabs me, Dave, is not just that he stopped, but, but what he does, the extent that he goes mm -hmm. to help this guy is what really amazes me because I've helped people before. You've helped people before. You've helped people before. But how far will we go? 
This guy goes above and beyond the call. Many times we do maybe what's necessary mm -hmm. or the bare minimum. Stop and let somebody use the cell phone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but are we going to change their tire? Are we going to take them to the tire store? Are we going to buy them a new tire? Are we going to get them a tank of gas? Are we going to get them a room for the night? And that's what he did. That's what he did all the way. And that's why he's the great example of the Good Samaritan. And, and Jesus doesn't even seem to dwell on so much on the wonderful things that he did and the amount of things, but the fact that he did it, period, mm -hmm. is what's the most important thing. That uh, he went over to the other side. And there is this idea of crossing over to the other side. The man who was injured, we don't know a lot about him. But apparently there must have been a reason why the, the priest went around and the Levite went around. They didn't want to become unclean. Maybe he was mm -hmm. not a Jew. Maybe because he was injured and there was blood involved. Whatever. But they weren't willing to stay, go to his side. Instead they made an effort to cross over to the other side to get away from him. And this crossing over to the other side, uh, you've got to be willing to help the poor guy that's in such great distress and not go to the other side and worry about your own concerns, about your own cleanness, uh, your own health, safety, these kinds of things. That extra measure of kindness that he showed is just incredible. What about this other side? We hear in politics about politicians crossing the aisle, going to the other side. Well, there's obviously less and less of that going on, but what about us average Joes? What about me, Jim? What about you, Dave? What about you and our viewing audience? We're the regular old folks, right? Working, doing this, living our lives here in the Upper Peninsula. When it comes to crossing, uh, go, uh, when we come across a situation like that of the Good Samaritan, what are we going to do? Are we going to cross over to avoid or cross over to the other person's side? And I think we can carry that into all kinds of of actions and reactions on our part, what, what we're going to do. Let's turn to Galatians 6, 7 through 10. The Apostle Paul tells the church, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever, whatever one sows, that will he also reap. Mm -hmm. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. That, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. This is like what Jim and I mentioned earlier in the show, is start a chain reaction. Pass it on. Pay it forward. Do good to others because it is going to be what you, what you uh, reap. Now, reaping and sowing, in the news lately, we've had a lot of people talking about, you know, the farmer and what he does. Well, I can teach you how to be a farmer. You put a, a seed in the ground and cover it up and you get corn. You know, when it comes to God's Word, every seed that is in the Word of God, if you plant it in your life, you're going to reap a beautiful harvest. Because the good things that can come back as a result of what you've done and the good things that will be given to others. Do you believe that Samaritan who was treated so kindly would pass by on the other side if he saw someone in need? He's going to be affected by that. So let's start that chain reaction so that others will do that as well. And pretty soon we're influencing our society for good. Just as people get caught up in a mob scene on the negative side and, and everybody seems to just, they don't, really don't know what they're doing, but everybody's angry and shouting and, and guess what? The same thing can happen for the good. Yes. And that's what we want to be a part of. We don't want to be a part of it being angry. We want to be kind to others. Oftentimes you hear us talk like this on the program. We'll say things like, when you're studying the Bible, you want to get in the context of what it is. Uh, you don't just pull a passage out mm -hmm. and, and, and stand out. You've got to look at the context of where it is in, the, in a particular, maybe letter in the, in the New Testament, being in the New Testament, being in the Bible, and you kind of go on down to where it is. But you start out in the larger context and work your way in so that you get the full 
view of what's going on. And as Dave went to Galatians 6, verse 7, I was just thinking, well, that's right after where we just were with all those nasties that he'd read mm -hmm. in Galatians chapter 5. And then the good of the spirit. We had the, the flesh and the, fl the fleshly nature and uh, doing all these awful things. And then we had the fruit of the spirit, all the good things. And then in chapter 7 or chapter 6, it talks about actually doing it, planting that seed so that the goodness can grow. And what we plant is what's going to grow. We, it's mm -hmm. just, it's very simple. It's straightforward. They all understood that. They, they were a rural agricultural people for the most part. And they understood planting and sowing and reaping. And if you planted one, one type of a seed, that's what you're going to get. You're not going to get something else. So if we don't plant the seeds of goodness, consideration, how can we expect to receive ever? No. It, it just doesn't work that way. And he says, do this in, in due season, then you will reap. And uh, as you have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, everyone, but especially to those who are in the church. You, if you're in believers. the church, you've got to, it's like, you know, your own family. If you forget about your own family at home, well, you've got to start there, right? And, and then work your way on out. You know, your family, your church family, the, your workplace, the, the school, the business, the recreation, all these things come into play. So what I'd like to do is uh, begin our next topic. And I want you to keep track of these, but if for some reason you would like a copy of our outlines and oh, what yeah. we're doing on these shows, I have them in my computer. I can print them out and mail them to you or I can email them to you. So consider one another part one and part two. And what we're gonna look at um, next is being present, which is interesting because we've got considerate, kind, present. It doesn't seem as much a part of characteristic as actually it is. How are you with, when you're with other people? Are you present? Are you engaged? Or are you drifting off somewhere else? So Jesus taught his disciples the same thing that the Lord taught the Israelites in the Old Testament. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Now that, that's engaged, that's being present. Your mind's involved, your soul's involved, and you actually hear and feel. Loving God is the greatest commandment. Jesus taught that the second greatest commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And that's found in Matthew 22. So when we look at those passages, we realize that's really kind of a definition of being present, God, in our heart, soul, and mind, and our neighbors are just as valuable. He said that sums up the Law and the Prophets when he was done at the, uh, with the Good Samaritan story. He said this is the Law and the Prophets. If you love this way, you will have fulfilled the law. So loving is the greatest command, and I believe listening should be the second greatest command. And that's why a neighbor, you actually have to be aware of what's going on with your neighbor if you're going to actually love your neighbor as yourself. So to show compassion and kindness to others, we must first notice someone's need. And notice implies a lot of listening because we need to know what's happening. That's what being present is all about. An example is on my walk to Walmart a while ago. I, I walked Meyer or Walmart or Menards, because they're the three biggest stores in Escanaba. <laughs> and I try to walk 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes in the evening, and then I go home. And I was walking into Walmart, and I said, hey, how you doing today? And it was a friend of mine who was in a wheelchair. And I see her often. And she said, not so good. By the time she said, not so good, I was already past her. See, I was using it as a common, hi. How are you? But I really wasn't asking how she was. And I thought to myself, whoa, she just said not so good. I stopped in my tracks, turned around and says, so what's going on? And we ended up coming into a conversation. I got to pray with her. I'm more present now than I was before that incident happened. That woke me up. If you're going to ask someone how they are, make sure you wait and listen to the answer. And then that, 
that allows you to be present. You can actually perceive, is there a problem that I can assist with? And that was one of my questions. What can I do? What can I do to help you? So love your neighbor as yourself. And so we're going to uh, look at being present at the beginning of next show as well. But I wanted to introduce it so you can actually say, okay, am I here? Am, am I relating and engaged with the others? In, or am I just a satellite just walking through by myself? In the, in, in the book of James, we have, if you will, a, a brief anatomy lesson. And uh, <laughs> Paul says that we are to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Okay, the anatomy lesson. Quick to listen. We got two ears. Slow to speak. We got one mouth. That should mean that we <laughs> listen twice as much as we talk. And for us ministers, that's a toughie. Yeah. We talk a lot. But he's saying that we need to be people that are actually good listeners. And that we're not thinking about what we're going to say all the time. To, to I, I call it like talking over the listening. I'm, I'm listening, but I'm not really listening because all I can think about is what I'm going to say because that's so important. Yeah. And you got to hear what I've got to say that we never, we might not even hear what they say if we don't listen. And, and if we listen more and we speak less, there's, a le there's also an opportunity for us to become less angry with others. And boy, won't that go a million miles mm. in, our, in our area, in our lives. Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. It's interesting that he's got the three of them in there together. Mm -hmm. And that's something we need to apply if we're going to be present in the situation. See, the ears are actually designed for hearing more than just what we're looking at. And so... They're not our most attractive feature necessarily either. You've got nice ears. But if we listen well, that, doesn't that make us more attractive? If I had ears like a mouth... I wouldn't have heard that young woman say, not so good today. So God has designed us to listen. And we need to be present and engaged in that. Engaged in life with others. Distractions and self-centeredness. Distractions and self-centeredness keep us from being present with others. And yet, the me first kind of society is keeping us, hindering us from being present. Dave, can you give us the points real quick before we go? Consider it. We need to consider others. Be thoughtful. Mm -hmm. Kind. Being kind means we're going to go out of our way to do something for someone the way we would like to be treated. And then finally, we're going to continue on this topic of being present and how we can do that more effectively. I want to thank you for being with me today. I've enjoyed these lessons and I'm still enjoying them. Next week, we still have one hour to finish these characteristics, and I hope you'll join us. Thanks for being present today. We look forward to seeing you again next week. And until then, you take care. God bless, and be courteous. God bless. Yeah.